Namaste and welcome to Pods by PEI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs, Inc. My name is Tadon Konsakar. In this episode, PEI Sara Blama sits with Anjal Nirola to discuss the potential and the many challenges for solar power in the Nepali electricity system. Anjal is an off-grid solar expert. He is currently the CEO of Camp Power, a renewable energy-focused social enterprise that has installed over 2,500 solar projects across Nepal. Anjal was a Shevening scholar at the University of Edinburgh and holds a master's degree in energy systems. He is also a future energy leader with the World Energy Council, where he works on the Energy Access Task Force. Saurabh and Anjal discuss Nepal's solar industry and its feasibility, with Anjal arguing for greater use of solar energy in a hydro-dominated electricity sector. The two talk about global solar uptake patterns and why Nepal's uptake hasn't followed suit, as well as Nepal's own renewable energy targets established through its nationally determined contributions. They also discuss some important policy-level issues such as the role of governmental institutions and the private sector in promoting renewable energy sources and evaluate their performance. They conclude the discussion with some technical solutions, including the importance of battery technology and recommendations for the country's future solar energy. We hope you enjoy the conversation. So a warm welcome back to all our listeners to another brand new episode of Pods by PEI. Namaste, this is Saurabh Lama. Namaste, this is Anjal Nirola. Welcome to Pods by PEI, Anjal. How are you doing today? All good. Thank you for having me. It is our pleasure to have you here at the PEI studio. Uh, Shall we get on with our conversation today? Absolutely. Before we get into the topic of the day, let me first give kudos for all the great work you and your team at Kampower have been doing in the solar power space in Nepal. And also, uh, congratulations for the recently launched Grid Resilience through Intelligent Photovoltaic Storage, it's a mouthful, or GRIPS project. Uh, Do you want to give our listeners a brief overview of the project so that uh, they can get a peek into into the kind of work that you do? Sure, sure. Um, Yeah, thank you for the compliment. Uh, Yeah, it's been a while since we um, started our work in the solar space. Um, So talking about the GRIPS project in particular, I think it's um, it's more... uh, continuation of of our work um, in solar over the last few years. Um, So what we're trying to address is the need for um, balancing the intermittency of solar um, and its impact on the grid, right? So uh, usually uh, solar is not available all the time. Um, There's there's obviously... um, the, our electricity grid itself is not very reliable. So how do we design a system um, that adds value uh, to the electricity grid and helps it become more resilient, um, introduce redundancy, right? So these are the things that we are trying to uh, understand and learn through the GRIPS project. Oh, that is wonderful indeed. We'll get into some of the issues that you just raised related to solar power, but let's begin our conversation today by painting an overall picture of Nepal's solar potential. Now, we are all aware about hydroelectricity potential that Nepal has. This is a topic that has been well established for the last four to five decades in Nepal's energy discourse, right? But you are from the solar sector, and I'm sure you see great potential within the solar space as well. So now, could you tell us and our listeners about what Nepal's true solar potential is, and if you think we can ever achieve this potential? Sure. I mean, um, so just like labeling numbers um, to potentials, I think, I mean, I I don't feel like it's it's probably the the right way to um, to, to, to do things, right? So even the 83,000 megawatt hydro potential, I don't know if it's truly achievable. So I think just assigning numbers to uh, is probably like, uh, it's not very relevant. But uh, I think the solar I see as having, um, you know, like a which is a very important place in Nepal's electricity uh, network uh, because obviously Nepal has a lot of uh, space that cannot be truly utilized. You know, like, so we've got uh, very, uh, we've got sharp hills, we've got uh, the desert in, in Mustang region, uh, you know, so there's there's plenty of space in Nepal that can be used to harness electricity. But obviously the true potential word is, is a bit loaded because then you need to factor in, uh, even if you build a large solar power plant in Mustang, can you really evacuate it, right? So where can the grid can actually accept 
um, this potential, right? So, uh, I mean, right now, I feel like uh, we can easily do 1,000, 2,000 megawatts of solar, um, you know, just immediately going forward. And uh, obviously, we need to balance it out with um, all the other support ecosystem that's needed, right? And, and that's where we can truly utilize the potential of solar. But to, to uh, the actual power of solar is the fact that it's demand-driven, you know, you can set it up very close to the consumption center, right? So you can build solar projects on your rooftop, you know, unlike hydro, where you need to go to a remote area, build large transmission lines. You practically don't need any transmission lines, right? So these are the, uh, these are the advantages of solar uh, that if you can truly tap into, you can help in creating a more robust utility grid uh, in our country. That is indeed great to hear, but... You and I both know that Nepal's electricity discourse and the system in general is dominated by a hydrocentric mindset. So you as someone with a skin in the solar game, how would you make a case for more solar power in Nepal? Sure. And, and for good reason, right? I mean, I think uh, Nepal is blessed with um, a lot of rivers, the fast flowing rivers, the geography uh, and, and, you know, like our geology, a lot of things allow for hydropower to flourish. Um, but I mean, having said that, there's, there's also uh, technology changes all the time, right? So um, hydropower was in fact, like very relevant uh, along, I mean, like, you know, for, for, uh, you know, for the last decade, even like 20, 30 years. Uh, but now with the technological in improvements, right? So now that we've got um, solar power, that's um, very cheap. I mean, like you look at um, the, the rates at which uh, people are bidding for solar prices in, in different parts of the world, uh, you can see that the prices of solar power is getting more and more competitive. Um, couple that with the fact that um, the battery prices are also falling mostly driven by the electric vehicle, um, you know, like market, but it's falling nonetheless. Um, it's also the fact that we also don't need transmission lines, right? I mean, if you build large scale hydro, I know of a lot of projects uh, where generation has been quite easy, but evacuating that power to the main substation is is the most time consuming part. That's where um, it gets the project gets super expensive. That's where all the social issues come into place, right? So the right of way, and then um, there's this tons of issues around that as well, right? So um, solar has its own space, you know, just uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, the fact that it's demand driven, you can build it very close to consumption centers. Um, say you're running an industry and you require hundred kilowatt, we can have that 100 kilowatt. If I need 500 kilowatt, I'll put up 500 kilowatt, right? So it's modular as well. So solar is a completely different technology, albeit it's renewable like hydro, but because of all these different traits, they all have their own space in an electricity network and both of them aid in making a grid more reliable and robust. And as consumers, that's what we need. Those are indeed some very valid points that you just made making a case for solar. But from a technical point of view, there are indeed a number of limitations that are often raised when solar power is brought up. The first uh, being the mismatch between the generation and the demand for electricity. That is, solar production only occurs during the hours of sunshine, whereas the peak electricity demand is during the morning and evening hours. Some of the other limitation that is also labeled is that solar is an intermittent source of energy. Um, in other words, it is highly affected by the natural fluctuations within the weather, which can introduce disruptions to the grid. So what is your take on these limitations? And is the Nepali system even ready for solar given these limitations? Sure. I mean, uh, I think I'll start with the last question first, right? Our, is our system ready? I mean, we've not even began, begun to scratch the surface of um, the true solar potential, right? I mean, even if you look at the overall uh, generation mix, solar is contributing like 5%, like much lower than 5%, right? So uh, within that threshold, like this, I mean, there's, there's no way to even, um, you know, test that um, assumption. I mean, in other countries, people have gone way above like 20, 30%, and that's actually been realized. Um, now, going back into, going back to the, uh, the other, um, uh, statement uh, that you made regarding, uh, you know, like the um, the time of day fluctuation of um, uh, of solar and and the fact that there's a supply and a demand mismatch, 
that's very true for a lot of the residential houses. I think it's just the fact that if you look at the overall consumption makeup of a Nepal electricity um, consumption, about 40% of that is cons- consumed by um, businesses and industries and and almost 40-50% is residential, right? So, uh, I mean, as the industries grow and and that's the way we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, like uh, increasing uh, Nepal's economy and, and we're trying to promote industries and uh, the majority of the consumption starts happening during the daytime. Right. So even if you look at um, right now, right, so uh, you, you can you can sort of uh, in Birganj, there's a lot of load shedding happening at the moment. Right. So uh, industries in Hetaura, industries in Piratnagar, you know, a lot of people that I've been uh, in touch with, uh, they often complain about lack of quality of power. Uh, it's it's not uh, timely. And, and even if there's no complete blackout, there are brownouts. Right. So there's I mean, it's it's the lack of the power quality is just not there. And uh, for for such industries right now, the the only option is you just take care of uh, things either with diesel generator. And then that would involve, uh, you know, importing more diesel fuel, which we do not necessarily have. And our government is trying very hard to cut down on the diesel imports as well, right? So, um, so solar fits perfectly well, like on top of industries, where you immediately help an ailing sector get access to a more reliable, cleaner power. And actually cheaper than uh, than than NEA as well, right? So basically, what we are doing at the moment is we are going to these industries and saying, "Hey, uh, sign a contract with us, a fifteen to twenty year PPA, and uh, our cost to you would actually be cheaper than what the utility charges you, right?" So that's a deal that we are already making, and our industries are are taking the, that up very easily. Um, now, uh, obviously. The the duck curve is actually a real phenomena, right? So I'm not trying to um to to just you know like uh, um, undermine that at all. Uh, I think the the way to address that would be through um, introduction of storage, right? And and obviously that's what we are also trying to understand uh, in our grips project, right? So solar alone would obviously immediately help a certain sector, which is the industries. But over time, coupling solar with battery storage and other forms of storage is the way to move forward. And obviously that would involve, uh, you know, more research and we're not going to get there overnight, right? So you start uh, with a few steps. You start with setting up solar's PV system. And then uh, as the battery technology matures, you go with the battery technology and you also uh, try and understand what the business model is, right? So how can you, um, how what kind of effect that would have on the utility grid? So all these things are things that you, uh, study over time, and you're not going to have all of that all at once, right? So, our uh, idea at the moment is to start deploying solar uh, in these distribution grid, and uh, supplement that with storage in a few years as we go along. I think battery storage is one of those things that even in our previous episodes, one of our guests did touch upon, and the importance of batteries in this electrical revolution is immense. I think that's well documented, but. I like to bring something that you touched on your uh, previous answer, which was the global uptake of solar electricity. Um, it is true, despite of the shortcomings that we just discussed, we do see a significant increase in the uptake of solar across the globe. Um, some studies have even shown that solar and wind now comprise two thirds of the global new net electricity generation capacity additions. But the way solar power is seen and made use of in Nepal is quite different, isn't it? On the one hand, this has been seen as a fringe technology, like um, it's been seen as a donor-driven sector, suited only for the purpose of increasing access to electricity for populations in remote places. And when we do discuss this as part of the grid, it currently accounts for less than a percent of Nepal's energy mix. So what are the reasons as to why Nepal's uptake for solar does not follow the global trend? Sure. Um, I think um, you, you touched upon like um, a lot of things there, right? So uh, I think solar, uh, obviously, if you look at the history of solar in Nepal, um, I mean, it's it's also a good fit, actually, you know, like places like Mount Everest Base Camp. Um, so we've done a project there um, in, in one of the research stations in uh, Lobuche at like 4,500 meters where um, like a few scientists, they're running a, um, a, a weather station, you know, like they're, they're gathering data around like climate change and and that project has been going on for like 20 years. Now, um, you know, just 
extending of our transmission line all the way up to low which would have been like near about uh, impossible i mean just financially right i mean there would have been it would have made no financial sense so uh, and and obviously we have a lot of regions in nepal which are so remote that um, setting up solar and battery makes a lot of sense and that's how solar was viewed initially right so even uh the the organization that um promotes solar in nepal is called alternative energy promotion center right so the concept here is that hydropower is the mainstream source of energy and um solar is the alternate right so that's how uh at least like you know when uh, we were envisioning our power system we were envisioning a uh, a system which was predominantly hydro and um, solar was uh, taking care of all the needs of uh, of the remote areas and that's true but at the same time the way the solar power has evolved and also like the way um, the electricity prices have dropped globally you know it just makes a huge case for solar and as nepal you cannot just look at your electricity infrastructure you also have to look at india's electricity infrastructure right so India was driven predominantly by coal right so with coal you know like you get a very solid base load right so the cost of electricity is is pretty much constant throughout uh, its operation uh, when you put into this renewable energy uh, generation like say wind and solar um it's you know the availability the intermittency plays into the factor and then the price goes up and down right so when you are um nepal is relying solely on hydro like you, even uh, the time of day at which nepal can evacuate the power to to india i think the the price that um our utility can fetch will also change tremendously right so uh, so just relying on even hydro makes you know like you need to be able to show, ensure okay at what time can you um can you uh, do these trades i think that defines a lot uh, how much profit any is able to get now uh, the fact that you introduce solar into the mix right so you introduce uh, batteries into the mix i think there's more opportunities for any to also maximize their revenue you know just because of all these changes that are happening to the electricity system not just in nepal but also elsewhere and obviously a lot of it is also driven by climate change you know which is an issue that we have not even spoken about right so um, hydro um, as a as a uh, you know like a, as a source of energy is driven by um, water like coming from glaciers and at the rate which glaciers are melting Uh, will they be around in the next 40 50 years is a is a big concern right so there's energy security um diversity so there's bunch of issues that um uh that we um we have to like grapple with right so um i think the the question uh, about um global energy global solar uptake i mean it's as i said i think just summarizing that uh, that thought there um i think it's been driven mostly by cost um in in areas around the world where people had to like uh, add more capacity or had to displace uh, these dirty generators i think that made a lot of sense in nepal as our demand is increasing as we need to uh, look for more energy security as we need to diversify our production as we need to provi- uh, pr- provide a more resilient grid in a world where prices of solar are decreasing at a, at a rate which battery prices are decreasing this just makes a great case for a uh, solar generation uh, in nepal uh, but obviously the uptake has not been there because just the concept has been so um, hydro centric but we do have a policy that is expected to hopefully result in greater adoption of solar in nepal's overall energy mix through our nationally determined contribution ndc nepal has set a target of 15000 megawatts of clean energy generation by 2030 of which 5 to 10% will be generated from solar and other similar renewable energy sources. So from your experience in the sector, how do you see these targets and do you think we are doing the necessary things to get there? Right so um I think first things first I think there's one thing to set a target but also like uh, once you set a target you need to s- start about defining like how do you get there right and uh, and if you look at the history of um of um uh, policies uh, supporting solar um it is actually like mostly been focusing on promoting solar in remote areas and solar has never been um in in conversation of our policy makers in terms of like how that can be uh, brought into the mainstream 
right? It's always um, a stepchild to to hydropower, uh, you know, <laughs> at least in terms of our policymakers. And I'll tell you why I say that, right? I mean, it's a strong word to to say, but um, initially, uh, the the PPA tariff uh, that you you define for uh, solar projects it's much lower than um, what hydropower um, has has been um, you know like uh, uh, is, is given right so for hydro you get um, PPA tariffs of 4.8 during the wet season and then 8.4 in the dry season uh, for solar it was initially 7.3 uh, and then it was dropped to 5.94 very quickly and now uh, you know like for the longest of time the PPA for solar has actually not been taking place. I mean, although there are um, statements that we make uh, during, um, you know, like did, like um, uh, making um, statements about NDCs, but um, our government at the moment is not signing power purchase agreements for solar projects. In fact, even net metering, uh, which is uh, which was, uh, you know, like which our uh, utility only started doing after years of, um, you know, like uh, difficulty. Uh, it's not been happening for the last five six months, right? So a lot of the uh, the the systems that have been on since July of this uh, of twenty twenty two, they've actually been um, not feeding into the grid, right? Which is a big setback. But whenever we are talking about electricity within the country, there is one entity that can never be negated, and that is NEA, which is the country's sole off taker of all electricity in the country. But in a political economy study that PEI conducted in 2021, which we have also covered in one of our earlier episodes of Pause by PEI, uh, and I would highly recommend that all our listeners go back and listen to. So we noted NEA's half-hearted commitment to off-taking solar electricity. This is something that you also touched on in your previous answer. So you also mentioned the reduction in the PPA price from 7 Point one zero down to 5.94 rupees per kilowatt hour. So what is your take on these mixed signals that NEA has been sending solar electricity manufacturers? Yeah, I think like um, we do not have um, a long-term vision in place. I think that's the, uh, the way I understand it, right? I think how NEA is looking at solar is, um, is they're looking at it as uh, uh, a generation that is sort of is not helping their um, overall utility grid. It's just taking away their revenue. I think like that's one perspective, and at least I've heard this in in some of my conversation with uh, with some of their officials, right? So, say like I set up a, a half a megawatt solar on a rooftop, um, and the the entity starts using their solar on their roof, right? So that means that. NEA is not able to um, to to gain a half a megawatt worth of revenue, right? And they've spent quite a bit in deploying this um, this infrastructure, like the distribution infrastructure. I think that's um, I think that's how they view it. But the way we look at it is that's actually a very myopic view, right? So in the short run, yes, uh, it is indeed reducing some of the revenue. But I think what about the other advantages of solar and batteries and other distributed uh, generation? in the utility, uh, in their distribution network. I think that's something that NEA has not done much homework on, right? So what I mean is uh, our discourse often, often um, involves talking about supply and demand, right? So we talk about 3,000 megawatt of generation, 5,000 megawatt of generation, 2,000 megawatt of uh, demand, 1,500 megawatt of demand. But I think what our conversation should also hover around is how do we get that generation to the people who need it the most, right? So the households, the industries, how do we ensure that they have a more reliable um, connection? How do we ensure that the voltage levels, the frequency levels are um, are up? And also like, how do we ensure that there's no load sharing? Right? So I mean, think about a customer, right? So um, they might pay nine rupees, 10 rupees to NEA, but the fact that they need to have a diesel generator as a backup, everybody needs to have a UPS as a backup, right? The cost of electricity is actually much higher than what NEA is charging to the end customer. Right now, if you look at how can solar and battery in strategic locations, um, that can actually feed reactive power into the grid. That will help NEA increase its increase its revenue. Um, if you can time shift energy, right? So basically NEA does not have much um, consumption during the nighttime, right? So if you can charge batteries with that power 
um, you know, during the night time and during the congestion time, uh, you can discharge this power. That can actually help NEA smoothen out um, their um, their their load profile, right? I mean, it, it will help them increase their revenue even further, right? So this myopic view that solar is actually eating into my revenue is not allowing developers like us and other innovators to have this space where we can experiment with distributed systems, where we can experiment with digital technology, which can in turn help NEA make a more robust uh, distribution grid, right? So that's the way we see it. Um, although the view is myopic, I think if you can like have a more, uh, if, you, if you can sort of like uh, step back a little bit and, and look at things from a more bird eye picture, you know, like how uh, trends are evolving all over the world, how battery prices are falling down, how the cost of transmission is going up. Um, that's the view that NEA should take, um, in my opinion. Hi there, this is Somit Nirnyapane from Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. We hope you're enjoying Parts by PEI. As you know, creating this show takes a lot of time and resources, and we rely on the support of our community to keep things going. If you've been enjoying the show and would like to help us out, we'd really appreciate it if you could become a patron on Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows listeners like you to support creators like us with a small monthly donation. Your support will go a long way in helping us continue creating high-quality content for you. So if you're interested in supporting our show and becoming a part of our community, head on over to Patreon and become a patron today. You can find us at patreon.com slash pods by PEI. Every little bit helps and we can't thank you enough for your support. Now let's get back to the episode. Well, that is kind of like the appeal that you just made to NEA. But what about the other institutions that are also working within the electricity sector that are responsible to promote renewable energy in Nepal? For example, you mentioned APC, the Alternative Energy Promotion Center. How about the Department of Electricity Development or even the Ministry of Energy for that matter? How do you evaluate their performance? Um, yeah, I think like um, uh, just uh, a lot of them get their feedback from one another, right? So um, I mean, it's um, I, I mean, there's, there's very li little space for innovation um, in these in institutions. I see, and 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 also like I understand a lot of the the internal processes and red tape as well, right? So, uh, and I'll give you an example, right? So for one of these large solar projects that that we were designing, we were asked to do an in uh, initial environmental examination and IEE, right? right. So we're trying to do that and and um we we realized that uh, and this was like way back 3 4 years ago and um uh, we went to um one of these organizations and we said okay like uh here um uh, here is the the IE and we were asked um okay where is the report on the fish because we are given this template of IE for a hydro project right so i mean uh, solar is not i mean IE for solar and IE for hydro is completely different right so the water level mapping and 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 fish and and all these analysis we had to do for a solar project where uh, you know which are completely not needed so a lot of our bureaucracy and and paperwork and and preparation all of it is based around uh, a hydropower and and a solar power plant development requires a completely different process. And I don't see like enough initiative taken by some of these organizations to educate themselves and educate their staff in terms of how this is being done in other part of the world, right? I mean, uh, we're sort of like just pushing solar down as much as we can rather than trying to open our arms and trying to understand like how it's being, um, you know, like adopted in other parts of the world. So that's, um, and, and obviously a lot of education is needed um, and a lot of open mindness, mindedness <laughs> is needed as well. But the criticism can not solely be levied on our governmental organizations, right? I mean, there are also a lot of criticisms that most of the private sector in the solar sector have only survived off of the subsidy provided by AEPC and the government, and that there are no genuine investors within the sector. How would you respond to such criticisms? I mean, see, like, um, you, you, 
reap what you sow, right? I mean, if you do not have provide fertile grounds for investment to happen, right? So for innovations to happen, I mean, that's the kind of rent seeking mentality you see in the market, right? So uh, basically solar power producers and not just solar power, I'll, I'll call them uh, distributed generation providers, right? So they're viewed as contractors, right? So you go to any, go to a lot of these institutions. Uh, most of the contract that's been drafted are turnkey project contracts, right? So um, this is no room for public-private partnership, right? So th that concept is still not materialized. Um, investment, uh, if you go to um, uh, some of these authorities where which require you to get, gain approval for foreign investment, right? it takes ages. Um, you know, the concept of distribution, like bringing in investment for uh, distributed generation does not exist. Right. So for us, like investment into energy is just investment into hydro. Right. So those policies have not been um, revised. And, and uh, if you do not create a fertile ground for uh, such discourse to happen, such innovation to take place, for people to take risks and still survive, you know, and, and obviously you get this mentality where people are um, relying on solar. And, and your assertion is actually quite true. I mean, I remember like a few years back. There are about like 200 solar companies in Nepal. Uh, a lot of them relying on um, on subsidies um, from APC and um, other institutions. Um, and and when, once um, the subsidy dried up, a lot of companies shut down. Unfortunately, I mean, I mean that's um, the reaction of of like the system. And and you know, um, and that's that's what I'd say to that. So you just brought up fertile land. I mean, that was a figurative fertile land, but I will, I will come to a more literal fertile land uh, in the case of Nepal. So another challenge that was raised by many of our respondents uh, for the political economy survey that we did mentioned that the issue of limited availability of land and most of the solar projects from a cost perspective can be constructed in the Tarai, which is the area with the most fertile land in Nepal. So how do you view this challenge? See, I mean, I think it's just a, a, a narrative uh, that has been constructed um, and does not hold uh, much stock, right? So see, like me, Gham Power, uh, uh, my company, we uh, specialize in building rooftop solar, right? So if, if the fertile land was an issue, I mean, like building rooftop solar should have been like, uh, you know, been allowed without, um, you know, like any restriction. But, you know, as a rooftop solar provider, we are subjected to um, so much more um, restriction as well, right? Even as I said, net metering is not allowed as well, right? So it's not just a matter of um, building solar projects in fertile land. And um, and so if you look, also look at the solar map of, of Nepal, the most solar irradiation is actually... Uh, in the northern parts, right? So Mustang, Manang, these are like areas with tremendous solar radiation. Uh, Tarai is actually like one of the uh, areas with the least solar radiation, right? So if I had an option, I would go and build projects in Mustang like 400 megawatt, you know, but then the problem is how to evacuate that power, right? So there's this bunch of things that you need to solve, right? So this ecosystem needs to be built for for solar to actually flourish and and uh, and the the and the reason a lot of projects are currently being built in um, in Tarai is because uh, not because of the land issue but because the transportation is easier right because uh, there's um, connectivity is easier you can just find a substation very close by and then the cost of installation is actually quite simple right so there are actually like the the fertile land itself is 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 a pretty weak argument um, i would think but Nepal was an early adopter of solar rooftop systems, at least back in the day when we used to have crippling load shedding. Some percentage of homes and businesses were installing solar rooftop systems despite the high cost, so they would have uninterrupted power. But as we have ended load shedding, which was an important incentive for solar adoption, do you think that the high upfront cost as well as the lack of access to financing for individuals and businesses is leading to decreased adoption. How would we go about improving the uptake of solar systems then? Nepal was one of the, uh, you know, like early pioneers of solar and battery for sure, right? So um, even during the days of load shedding, and that's when we were um, established, by the way, right? We did close to 2,000 systems, right? So a lot of these systems where we'd go to people's houses, businesses, and set up solar and battery. And um, and obviously, if the utility has no power, you need to generate it from somewhere, right? And it solved a lot of problems as well. Now, um, 
for that to um to to sort of like scale up now i i i think that it's um so the current um so uh, uh, right now is actually a, a better time for solar i would say compared to the times when um we had extensive load sharing and i'll tell you why right so um when we had load sharing 10 years ago the price of solar was 1.5 dollars per watt um two dollars per watt right now uh, the prices of solar are down to 30 cents per watt right so which is incredible reduction in cost the same with batteries right so the battery technology has matured tremendously in those last 10 years and the costs are falling down right so the overall capital cost to set up a one kilowatt system 10 years ago versus now is is a, a multiple of two or three times cheaper right and and along with that our manpower, uh, you know, like the technical skill set of installers has increased tremendously. Our banks have acquired tremendous knowledge with regards to this distributed energy financing, right? So the time to finance and to install solar has never been better, right? Just in terms of um, the support ecosystem um, that we currently have. But to get to a stage where we can start actively deploying systems, a lot more is needed, right? So we need to open up regulation around how investment is mobilized into these systems, right? So um, our liquidity in our country changes significantly. Um, a lot of investment is required for us to deploy solar projects. So foreign uh, investment regulations have to be um, have to be um, looked into. Uh, you know, there's there's still a lot of uncertainties around. Um, you know, like okay, what kind of how do we promote um, a company that holds like hundred assets, right? I mean, and I had this conversation with this uh, government um, official um, looking into a file where um, we, we we said, okay, uh, you need to do an IEE, and I said, okay, unlike a hydro project where we like which operate at one site, I operate at hundred sites. Where do I do an IEE? We look both looked at each other like very puzzled, and and he goes like do an IE at your office then, you know, like, and I was like, okay, what purpose that would serve, right? So obviously the, the regulation and the understanding of, um, of um, our, um, you know, like uh, bureaucracy, I think like that can be uh, improved tremendously. Uh, we still need like strong support from the NEA. Uh, I think we, we talked about um, earlier uh, how NEA should not view solar as a competition. It should view solar and companies which are working in digital uh, solutions, distributed um, generation as um, as collaborators, right? Not as competition, as something that helps them achieve, um, you know, like um, increase their efficiency, reach more customers and, and also increase reliability, right? So that's how NEA should view them. In fact, I can, um, I, I mean, I've actually been seeing this for a while, but I'm, I'm actually open to, um, to, to, to NEA investing in us, right? I mean, I just, yeah, just they are looking for investment opportunities. I think we're, we're the kind of, if they can build a hydro projects, why not invest in solar projects as well, right? I think that would actually send out a strong message as well um, in terms of to, to foreign investors, like give them confidence to enter into a market where we'll see more players um, and, and, and obviously with the introduction of more players with a more robust ecosystem, we'll see more deployment. But here's a question that's on a slight tangential note, but I really wanted to ask this question to you. So if the intent is to increase the solar uptake in our generational mix, would it not be easier or cheaper for us to be importing solar electricity from India where it is being produced at under rupees 3.5 per kilowatt hour, which, whereas in the case of Nepal, the proposed rate was rupees 5.94. I mean, see, like, so when you look at energy um, policy of a country, I think um, energy generation mix is, is probably like one aspect, right? So um, energy, um, you know, like um, security is the other. Right. So um, if we are to say that, OK, we'll import everything from India and like shut um, down like, you know, even like uh, inhibit the growth of our ecosystem, right? So, I mean, um, for us to get to that stage where India is generating at three cents per kilowatt hour, and we look at our developers in Nepal, and I think there's a, it's, a, it's a good question that you ask. Why are we not able to generate electricity at the same rate as, as India? And I'll give you an answer, right? I mean, um, we we've neither have the experience 
of um, of not just installers, but of also like investment structures, like um, the support from the utility. Um, so there's uh, the the transmission line building, right? The the land prices, the sizes of the project. There's a bunch of things that like stop us from getting to to prices um, which. India can can generate electricity at so it's not a apples to apples comparison, right? So it's a completely different scale at which we're looking at these two things. Now, if we are to say um, that okay, India is doing it much cheaper, um, we can just like import energy from them. I mean, what I would say is okay. Do you still remember 2015, 2016 when you had to buy petrol uh, at five dollars per liter? Uh, you know, I mean, is that is that not a, a realistic thing going to happen in the next uh, five years? I mean, uh, I would have liked to have my energy um, security um, robust as well um, before, um, you know, like I decide on my energy policy just based on prices. So what I'm making of our conversation so far is that Nepal does have a lot of solar potential, perhaps even more or as much as our hydro potential, but there are significant challenges in the sector to be able to fully exploit this potential. So, hypothetically, if you are asked to be at the helm of the Ministry of Energy, what are the three things um, that should happen within the sector? What would your first course of action be? Yeah, I think I'd stop being fearful. I think um, we are very fearful to change. Um, I think um, as utility, as um, as ministry, as practitioners, um, we, the, the distributed revolution is happening, whether we like it or not. You know, the prices are falling. Um, you know, like a few years from now, I think there could actually be a situation where I can just have solar and battery in my house, a much more reliable power. No, and, you know, like that power could be cheaper than the grid. Right now, um, I think the way I would look at this is let's not suppress um, production, right? So there's a lot of, um, you know, like um, companies still struggling to get PPAs at the moment, right? I mean, at the same time, there's um, demand uh, is still, we're, our net kilowatt hour uh, per capita consumption is uh, is actually like one of the, the lowest in the world, right? So there's there's still so much more energy that we can consume, right? I mean, our industries um, are struggling, right? Every year is the same story where our industries like um, either have um, very bad quality power, um, you know, it's, um, they have to like focus on creating diesel in and, and it's, it's it's not it's not a ripe uh, climate for for development, right? So um, our demand can actually be much higher, right? So if you're a entrepreneur looking to start an industry or a manufacturing plant, you think twice. You always the first thing goes like, okay, should I buy something electric because where's the reliability? Uh, the same goes with um, with my family, right? So I I still use uh, uh, LPG gas in my house, right? Because um, I, all the induction stoves are quite competitive now. Reliability is an issue, right? So our when we talk about like um, generation and and production, if you're not able to solve the reliability factor, the uptake is not going to be high, right? So I think what I would do is not be afraid. I would allow generation to 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 happen, uh, evacuating that power into NEA. Yeah, to to India. I think that's the other thing that we need to look at, look into. I mean, like there's this diplomacy needed. Um, there's a long term vision and plan behind these negotiations, right? I mean, um, every time we've got these ministerial shakeups and like you know just our uh, narrative and our our stance uh, towards like these negotiation positions changes quite uh, significantly, right? So just having that consistent narrative and like view um, and taking up a certain negotiation position with India is, is obviously needed um, while also exploring export opportunities um, to places like Bangladesh, right? So uh, you have to keep exploring these options, but you cannot stop uh, a nascent industry from, from growing, right? So um, if you cannot, if you're not able to have um, export opportunities, I, there's, there's enough demand uh, possibilities inside the country. Right. I mean, we've got seasonal variations already. Right. So we've got like uh, a lot of excess generation in the monsoon. But in the winter, we have large deficit. Hydrogen becomes a, a interesting um, area to explore. Right. I mean, when we have like so much hydro, uh, so much hydro excess during the monsoon, can we use that to 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 
create hydrogen right i mean that's uh, this and that's the way and that's also a battery technology in a sense right i mean it's in i mean sort of like inefficient battery but still like i mean you can use that to replace other forms of gas right so uh, so there's seasonal variation that you can balance uh, there's daily variations that you can balance using storage and then solar and other distributed forms of generation but in a whole you cannot yeah, stifling generation and production and uh, for innovation, uh, you know, just having that one consistent message that you can follow for five, 10 year horizon. I think that's, uh, I mean, if you can just iron out that vision and get uh, everybody to agree on that vision and and let innovators, let uh, investors and let all these uh, other ecosystem to flourish around them, I think our, our energy um, industry would be in very good hands. So here's one final question to wrap our incredibly insightful and reinvigorating conversation. So we discussed a lot of things today. We discussed some very pertinent policy problems, some important technical solutions, among other things. But if we are to go back to the very beginning of our conversation today, we discussed that Nepal's electric sector is dominated by a hydrocentric mindset. So do you think, or perhaps, how can we bring a transformation for solar energy to be viewed as being part and parcel of Nepal's energy system? Sure, sure. I, I think um, we, we started this conversation by talking about the GRIPS project. And I think um, through the project, that's what um, we, um, we want to do, right? So I think over the longest of time, I think what I've realized is that um, solar energy and uh, hydro and grid, and we've sort of like been tussling and, and this has been tug of war, you know, like it's, um, I think uh, what is needed, and, and we obviously talk about like a lot of theoretical things, right? So we do calculations in Excel, um, we have our own numbers that we like to throw, but uh, the actual test uh, and actually like people have not actually gone on the ground and, and done things and, and shown people things, right? So just seeing is believing. I think that's something that I've learned um, very hard way. So what we're looking to do through the GRIPS project is, um, is I've got like people from NEA on board. Um, they're one of my advisors. They're, they're looking at this project very keenly. Uh, what we're doing is we're setting up a small solar battery plant in a distribution network, and we're studying its effect on the grid. Right. I mean, um, obviously, um, as a solar um, practitioner, my business model, my end customer, like what kind of benefits, these are easy to calculate. I mean, there's a few numbers, but what kind of effects would this system have on the grid has not been quantified, at least in monetary terms. Right. So that's what we're looking to do through the course of the project. Now, uh, with any advising on this project and with us being able to share the result of this project with uh, a wider audience, our aim is to demonstrate that um, the project can actually have a much, um, you know, like a larger, a better effect on the grid than uh, what they think, right? So rather than just like talking about it, uh, just go there and, and show it. Right. I think that's been our approach and um, and that's what's needed, actually. I think you just need a few, um, you know, like a, a risk takers to go out there and just do it, you know, and, and, and show it. Because, I mean, it's obvious you've seen it happen elsewhere in the world. And, and um, I think our policymakers really need to see it. And I mean, obviously, everybody's looking after um, the best interest of the country. We're coming at it from a lot of different angles. But uh, if you can come together, uh, meet at a place and look at the same sets of numbers, all of us, and then uh, I'm pretty sure we can come to a um, to to right conclusion. So now that we're coming towards the end of the episode, is there anything you would like to convey to our listeners? What is the Kampar team up to these days? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think um, we, um, I mean, are a bunch of engineers. Um, so we, we love to just go out there and do. Um, so we've been doing projects all over the country. Um, you know, we build microgrids. We're working um, also with a lot of smallholder farmers trying to see how we can mechanize uh, some of the agricultural processes, um, introduce renewable energy into the mix um, because it's it's a lot of, uh, it's a sector which could do with a lot of uh, renewable energy as well. Um, we're trying to build solar rooftop projects. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening at our room, at our office. Uh, we have our own R&D team. Um, this is, um, it's, it's exciting. So yeah, I mean, um, 
if you want to learn more about solar and all the work that you're doing, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I think we're happy to collaborate um, on anything solar, um, anything energy, um, and if it's out of the box, um, yeah, I can't is like uh, onto it. And with that, we've come to the conclusion of today's episode. Thank you very much, Anjal, for graciously accepting our invitation to be a part of Pause by PI. I wish you and the Kampar team all the very best in your future endeavors. And I hope to hear lots of great things from your GRIPS project. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Sara, for having me. I think um, it's been a pleasure having this conversation. And um, congratulations um, to the PEI team on, on this absolutely brilliantly hosted podcast. Thank you, folks, for tuning in. Please join us again next week for another episode of Pods by PEI. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to Pods by PEI. I hope you enjoyed Saurabh's conversation with Anjal where they discussed the potential and the many challenges for solar power in the Nepali electricity system. Today's episode was produced by Nirjan Rai with support from Saurabh Lama, Kushi Hang, and me, Thedon Konsakar. The episode was recorded at PEI Studio and edited by Ridesh Sapkota. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakya from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast also, please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. For PEI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. And to catch the latest from us on Nepali policy and politics, please follow us on Twitter at tweet to pei That's Tweet, followed by the number 2, and P-E-I. And on Facebook, you can find us at Policy Entrepreneurs, Inc. You can also visit PEI.center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Tadon, and we'll see you soon in our next episode.